Okay, so today's guest has played four test matches for England, taking 551 this winter against South and Port Elizabeth after a, a brief period out of the England side. He was a teammate uh, when he came on loan to Yorkshire last year. Um, so welcome to the Spin Badger podcast, Somerset's Don Best. Hello, mate. Matt, thanks for coming on, mate. Really appreciate it. So uh, start at the beginning. Like, How did you get into bowling spin? Yeah, um, I think it's been recorded a little bit, but I was quite fat when I was younger. Um, I remember, I reckon I played two games, um, bowled a little bit of seam and tried to bowl a little bit of away swing and probably didn't um, come out as expected and shortened up the run up, saved, my, um, saved me getting tired and started sort of flicking them out as offies um, and that's sort of where it all began um, I was always I was down at Sidmouth Cricket Club where I grew up and always um, sort of had the always had sort of um, my always in the nets really always had my cousins there and everything so yeah mate that's sort of where it all began always bowling at my older cousins getting whacked um, facing them being a couple of years older, facing them, getting hit in the head and all that. So, mate, it all, all began back there, yeah. Would you say, like, early on in your career, like, who, uh, who are your big influences? Was it just your cousins or was there other people who were uh, really helpful? So, I think I spent a lot of time with my grandfather. Um, he, he certainly had a lot to do um, with my sort of young playing days. I always used to go to their house and he used to bowl at, bowl at me for days um, and then he always used to whack me around as well so I think he was a real big um, real big influence he always used to take me down the nets as well um, yeah my cousins um, my dad as well certainly played a real big part of it and then um, probably my under 10s 11s coach um, Charlie Dibble so Adam so you know Adam Dibble the ex-Somerset yeah. Um so his dad's brother um, so his uncle, um, his his son, Charlie's son, um, was a year above me. Um, so I always used to play in age groups with him and he was an off-spinner for the local club. So I guess I, I learned a lot, lot off him. Um, and then, so yeah, growing up through through the childhood, um, I had my cousins around, my best mates, played a lot of cricket, um, a lot of sports in general. And then, like I said, going into it, obviously Somerset Academy was massive. Um, likes of Jason Kerr, now the head coach at Somerset. He, he was the first one that picked me up on the, um, on the academy. Nice. That's good to have someone who you work with when you're younger, obviously now uh, head coach at Somerset. But I guess like kind of skipping a little bit through the academy, like uh, on your, I think it was your, played against you on your Champo debut and you absolutely cleaned up. I think it was like <laughs> six for 20 or something <laughs> uh, against Warwickshire. And like what, what kind of stuff do you think that you kind of learned at the academy or, or what kind of things do you think played a big part in you being successful when you're a championship debut? Mate, um, I take my academy days. Um, re- I used to, like, I look back now, I, I absolutely love the experience I got from them. They were always so challenging. Um, and actually, I wasn't always sort of the standout in the academy. So, Within my academy, I had the likes of Bartlett, um, Ben Green, who was playing obviously for the 19s, Tim Rouse, um, who unfortunately just got released last year, but quality cricketer. Um, I had these lads sort of in and around me. um, And for me, I was never really sort of um, sort of seen as like the top top dog. And I think that really worked for me, actually. I've always had to sort of graft through it and get through it and sort of find a way, I guess, so cliche, but find a way to sort of survive, certainly in that academy environment. Um, And I think the resilient side of it, me keep bouncing back, keep trying to get better with my peers, um, always worked. And still, even when I sort of left the academy, I went away to uh, Darren Lehman Academy in Australia. I didn't get a contract, so I went away there, came back, um, played a summer played a summer for Somerset, but I wasn't contracted. I had sort of no obligation to go there. I actually went on an open open trial to Leicester that sort of 
April um, that no one really knows of, actually. Yeah, that's quite yeah. interesting. Never knew about that. Um, yeah, so like no one knows about that side of it. And that, I guess, so going back to your question about what really worked for me, um, that Champo game was by, I guess, what happened two, three years before that in the academies, getting little knockbacks and actually realising that I've just got to keep going, keep grafting. It's an art. It's a craft. And we, obviously, we know, certainly between us at Yorkshire, we're still learning, still chatting about it. Um, but, mate, I think the big thing I take out of that game was my resilience, my resilientness for the past two, three years, I think finally broke through that game. Um, and I obviously took wickets. And I got a heap of confidence that I can actually play at this level. Um, and that was a real big learning curve for me. So it wasn't actually my skill. It was more like me mentally um, sticking by it. And I think that's a great, as a spinner in general, I think that's a great learning curve. Um, and something that we've got to be very good at is being resilient. Yeah, definitely, mate. I think completely agree with everything you've said there. I think that like resilience and, and perseverance to keep coming back from setbacks and, and knockbacks, like you said, is is massive. And I think, a lot of people like who know a little bit about your journey, especially as you've had a lot of success at a very young age, you probably just think that, you know, it's plain, plain sailing, like yeah. academy, straight in second team, dominate straight in first team. Whereas actually to hear that you, you know, had to go away a little bit and probably didn't get a contract where you wanted to start, like that's, I'd say that's probably like very, very common for a lot of spinners yeah, and fingers, how, how we develop. So I guess the message there for, young spinners or any young cricketers is you know if, if you do get those setbacks for me like that's a really good chance to not only learn from it but also kind of prove to yourself and a lot of people that you you keep coming back because that is that is a massive thing uh you said that you went away to Darren Lehman Academy like what was that like and yeah. did, you, did you learn much out there specifically about spin bowling yeah so mate I um so that was I think again for my journey as an 18 year old coming out of school quite uh, naive um, I obviously didn't get a contract in the summer and, and I guess I was always expecting that I was going to get one even though I, I obviously hadn't performed or anything like that so it was quite a big shock and I got this opportunity to go away with the Lehman Academy um, and I was so it was the last um, it was the last sort of funding that the ECB did out there for the academy so I was with the likes of George Hankins uh, Owen Morgan, left arm spinner from Glamorgan. Sunny Singh uh, was on that one. Yeah, Sunny Singh was on that. I had I had a very funny story actually with him. Um, he he was, we probably didn't see eye to eye at the start, but he, funnily enough, like we got on like house on fire after that, and really enjoyed him. Um, we had uh, Anira Donalds, um, obviously now at Hampshire, like again a quality cricket. We had Graham Clark from Durham. Um, Shane Snater was on there as well, now plays at Essex. We had a, actually a great group of lads. And I think for me, the learning curve out there and playing hard cricket out in Australia um, as an 18-year-old, trying to perform and actually day in, day out, graft again um, away from your home was a real big learning curve. And I, I absolutely loved the time out there. I think it was, it was so much fun. Um, obviously... You're living with other lads your age. It's almost like the uni experience within six months. Um, certainly coming away. And and I think for me, it, with my cricket as well, obviously I took it really seriously. And I think that's day in, day out. Again, going with the likes of someone like Anara Donald, who actually went to the World Cup that year and bowling against him. Uh, Finn Hudson Prentice was out there as well. And I know yeah. he's he's now around back in back in the game, which is good to see. And he's been doing well. And, Having those blokes around and training with these guys was, again, it was sort of put me, it put me up against my peers, and I had to, I had to keep going and adapting to um, stay afloat with them. And I think that was really good. Um, my club, my club cricket out there, I played actually quite a lot of second team, second grade stuff. Um, when I did play in the first grade, I, our side was actually Graham Clark play. We played for Northern Districts in Adelaide, and that's Mark Cosgrove's club. Um, so we had Cozzy, um, Joe Gatting used to play yeah. um, for Hampshire, Sussex, we had him. We had Sarah Taylor, that was the year she made her like grey cricket debut. I don't know if you can remember that. So 
we had her, Graham Clark, myself. So there was like five English um, people out there. And, and again, it was an amazing experience for me to play with these sort of guys. Um, and actually, funny enough, that's where my sort of open trial came, was with Cozzy, um, asking if I could have a sort of open net with Leicester. Obviously, nothing ever really came of that and sort of the journey carried on. But I think that year was massive for me. Um, again, in my personal development, me growing as a player, but also as a spinner, learning how to how to bowl on wickets out there that um, was obviously a lot, probably a lot better, um, better wickets and actually bowling in hot conditions and also Aussies who want to try and take you down. Yeah, definitely. I'm not scared of having a slog against an English spinner, but I think like... <laughs> I think, like you said, the main thing there is that surrounding yourself with good people who not only are probably quite skillful cricketers, but also in a similar boat of trying to improve can be can be really important. So you mentioned there about on like you know uh, flat pitches out there, and you obviously played for England Lions this winter uh, in Australia, and you know if you compare that with especially at the start of your career at Somerset, you, you know used to be really spinner friendly how like do you change much in different conditions yeah and I think that's my that's what's been my learning curve certainly this year um so you take the lights of when I first came onto the scene at Somerset we're obviously producing spinning wickets and all I had to do is really land land it in area um over a long period of time and sort of the wickets would do it for me and obviously that had initial success for me and sort of put me on the radar a little bit but I think, then yeah, when I, I certainly that's, that's still a skill though isn't it like although you yeah, know it is. standing at the yeah, yeah. end of the day like you've also got a lot more pressure on you so although, um, like, and you know what it's, it's there is a flip side because I feel like I was always grown up with that pressure at Somerset so for me I actually really enjoy it and I think it's a it's been like a great point for me is actually when I do go to spinning wickets, I feel comfortable. I feel yeah, like I'm yeah, in my element. Yeah. Um, and I would say with that, um, like, you, like we're going to say, like going to Australia and where it's a lot flatter, um, certainly my job has always been as a second spinner, obviously behind Leachy, is to come and produce wickets. But certainly recently, say last year, obviously when I played at Yorkshire, I had to do that role um, of holding and learning actually how to bowl. Um, even I tell you what, my I reckon my first genuinely my first experience of being the only spinner in the side was playing for England. Yeah. When yeah. I when obviously Leach got injured, and I bowled on one, I bowled wicket. Obviously, my first test was at Lords, yeah. and I bowled on a pretty green one. Um, and I obviously got a bit of um, sort of and got analysed a little bit with my seam position, but I had never. Because I played at spinning wickets, I'd never thought really anything of it. Yeah. I thought that was just a real good team position and I, it came out nicely. And I look back now thinking how much I've learned now from actually playing on flatter wickets. Your craft is so much more. I know now, I know I can change my seam position and probably in, on a flatter wicket, you're not going to bowl as much side spin and you're going to try and firstly as well control control the first innings, um, get your field and get the field where you want it and bowl to that and make sure actually whatever happens off the wicket, um, depending on whatever wicket is, if it's a flat wicket, you've then got to actually look about not what you do off the wicket, but actually how you could beat them in the air, how you could beat them in the flight, how you can almost beat them in a bit of an ego, ego way if they're very if the batters have got big egos and actually want to try and take you down. So I think that is a big thing that I learned sort of through my career and go to that Australia, um, go to the Lions in Australia. I think having the two years I had in Australia, um, club cricket, I certainly got a feel for, obviously it was a lot better wicket, but at the MCG, but you get that feel of just Australia in general as the environment and like obviously probably a little bit more bounce. So I certainly, for me, I know my top spin came in or bowling, trying to get my seam a little bit more upright and trying to get the bounce on it um, was something so crucial. So, yeah, I think it is so important. Wherever you go is actually to learn how to bowl on these wickets and have plans. So is it like just seam position or do you change like the pace you bowl, the lines you bowl? Like, 
Yeah, everything, I think. And obviously, your cra- I think your craft's obviously very, as a leg spinner, I, you'll know as well with that, if it is a flatter wicket, you know that your pace might have to change. And it might have to, if you know the players inside out, you might think some players actually, you might actually have to bowl a little bit slower to them um, to probably get the best out of you. Or you might have to bowl a little bit quicker, flatter. And it depends on the day, depends on what position you are in the game. Um, I know, obviously, I listened to Jeets one. And obviously, I worked with Jeets a little bit this this winter. And I think he's world class. And I've got even more respect for him um, working with him now because the way he thinks about it is phenomenal. Um, and he's always talking about playing the game. And I certainly think your pace, your your field settings, how you go about it over around the wicket, all comes back to actually playing the game and being within, being present and within that game. So I think that's really important as well. Yeah, definitely. I think I was very lucky to play with uh, Jeets at Warwickshire for a long period of time and, and work with him. Like, what was what's been his big influence? Like, I guess in the England setup. Uh, with you guys so far like I think it's um, like you said he obviously spoke really funny of him there and in swing to park as well it's, it's great to hear that you both feel like he's adding value but what are the specific stuff that he's spoken to you about so for me we we actually talk about um, so my rhythm into my uh, I think my rhythm into my action and my jump is really important and trying to create that that bound in that's something we looked at um, and then actually releasing the ball. And one big thing he spoke about was trying to release it as late as possible, um, which really, really clicked with me. And I think it really helped me. So he talks about this almost fish hook. And, um, and if I release the ball, trying to release it as late as, late as possible and then pull him back, almost back off the ball. Um, and that's for me like almost the last little bit of my action but that's something we spoke about a lot because I think initially actually it almost helps um, it helps with the shape of the ball um, and I certainly felt that way and actually also my pace I wanted to get my pace up a little bit from sort of I say two mile an hour quicker and but we know with spinners we don't want to just bowl it quicker with no pace and tr- you want the trajectories to still be there. So it was actually working out how to do that within my action. So like I said, we talk about my bound, we talk about my momentum towards the crease, how that is. Uh, we talk about my jump, making sure it's real strong. And obviously if you look at Jeet's action, um, someone I look at a lot as well as Nathan Lyon, you look at their actions and they're so strong and snappy. And I think, when he talks about that fish, fish hook, that's obviously the last um, point of that sort of snap, I guess. Um, but, mate, I can't, I can't um, say how much I enjoyed working with him in South Africa. And I think um, what he did there really opened up my eyes again of actually challenging myself and making sure that I sort of go the, the next level, hopefully. So you should say about the fish hook, but I don't know if I'm going to do this just by talking but when he's like flicking the ball to himself in his hand like that's what he's that's what he does like I never noticed yeah it, like now you say it I think like you know he's that almost like you say that that um so he, he do you know what's amazing actually because I it was funny I because and this is something he told me to work on actually and mate the times he laughed at me when I me and Parky were sat down in the 12th man dugout and I was trying to do what he does and I was throwing it onto the field of play but <laughs> Yeah, he's like he he'll sit there and he'll he'll like he'll he talks about your sort of palm of your hand and your wrist position being real strong, and I know when I always as a spinner you flick it, I always sort of flick it sideways if mm. I'm facing you, and actually he was like, why are you doing that? Because it's just almost you're almost producing this habit where actually when you go to bowl, you bowl with an open palm, and he was talking like about actually practicing. Um, just doing it to yourself so it's actually like that to yourself and pulling back on it I was doing it and obviously if you watch him do it he gets it up and about like literally to him just up and I was doing it I was throwing it out and obviously you yeah. know what Parky's like Parky was 
getting in my ear, throwing his 50p in, which is always enjoyable. I think, yeah, I think like I've seen Jeets do like exercises as well, where he like almost isolates his shoulder and he's just doing it into the net, like to really work yeah. on that, that wrist position you talk about. And I think that, like you said, that I definitely encourage all young spinners to always have a ball in the hands, flicking around. But I remember Ian Salisbury said to yeah. me, like, leg spin equivalent is you want to spin it back to yourself. If you're just spinning it almost alongside yourself, that's not a proper side spinning leg spinner. So. Yeah, definitely. Like, like very small things, but it can can obviously help you. So, uh, someone else you work with this winter, like, mate, you've been a bit all over the place, Spencer, haven't you? And, like, when I was thinking about yeah. like, India, South Africa, Australia, even Sri Lanka for a bit, like, going back to India where you work with uh, Harat, that's someone like I've, I've never really come across. So, I just wondered, like, what his kind of philosophy is about bowling and, and what stuff he kind of helped you with. Yeah, mate. And actually, I tell you what, the the um, India tour, like doing my month in India, set me up. I think for that South Africa trip, and and I think uh, someone who played a massive part as well that I I also can't speak highly enough is Richard Dawson. Um, obviously now Gloucester, mate. He was quality, um, and to have him and Harath, um, I think was a great was a great combination because um, obviously we had Haraf and, and his, his belief, his genuine belief about spin bowling was 90% sort of up in your head and being very tactical. He said that obviously, um, obviously there will always be something to work on technically and things like that. But he certainly said, um, once you're sort of at your level, um, it's a lot more mental and a lot more actually understanding the game. And like Deet said, playing the game, and I think that really took that I gave I actually had a lot of confidence from that side because um, that gave me a lot of confidence him saying it um, and he actually did a little bit of research on me and the other spinners I know he did a bit on birds and mace as well and and I actually sat him down for probably about an hour and a half which for us is absolute absolute gold dust and I literally just voice noted him on my phone and just had a chat with him and I just couldn't believe how he how he keeps it so simple and actually think about him as a him and as a cricketer and his stats they are phenomenal mm. um and how simple he kept it was again gave me real clarity of making sure that we don't overthink things um and we work with what we've got and i think for me a big thing that i said what we worked on was um i've always said i always used to love him dropping his dropping his arm and he always used to sort of like scuttle in, drop his arm. Either one kicks on, hits pads, or like somehow he spins it and um, takes the stumps. And he talked about it two ways. Um, he talked about obviously lowering your arm and keeping the same hand position, or in fact dropping your wrist. And I'd never thought, I'd never thought anything like that. Well, like undercutting. And I it. think that, yeah, like undercutting it with still. Um, so he said he had two deliveries where he dropped his arm, obviously, and then he could drop his wrist and sort of drop, like almost like a saucepan, which is ridiculous to think of. Or he could keep his same action and drop his wrist instead of having like a strong wrist that we talk about. He drops his wrist, almost flicks it out. And I think how he talked about it like that, I had never really thought about it. Um, and that was something I worked on a lot with him. And in fact, I think. If you go, then you go to South Africa and um, you look at um, the wicket I got uh, Faf de Plessis out at Port Elizabeth. I dropped my arm, and that was something I was working six weeks ago. And it was just obviously coincidental that now in a good spot, he ran down and it got caught short leg. But for me, again, it really went back to actually, I probably bowled, oh, that honestly, I probably bowled about a thousand balls of them in India, practicing it. And then Obviously, going to South Africa, I was making sure I was practicing that as well as my best ball, because he also spoke about be it like your best ball is is where you sort of build from, and I really do believe that as well. Um, and that's when he talked about being simple is so not having all these m magic balls and different deliveries is actually potentially having two balls, um, your best ball, your stop ball, and then potentially something else, and something else might look like actually your stop ball, but from um, from a different 
angle or a different place on the crease. And I think it's having that clarity and that clearness. Um, that was something that I really picked up from um, about him. And it's actually amazing now because I hate to sort of drop name, but like he gave me his number and he said, mate, if you've ev ever got any problems or anything, or you want me to look at anything, he was like, please, please send me, send, send it to me. And sort of that spinner's union was quality because I was like, oh, he actually wants to help us. Um, and I know I obviously came back and I spoke to Leach, you know, so I'm really good mates with Leach and Leach was oh, like, literally tell me everything. So yeah. that was awesome to then like sort of talk to him about it. I think he was in New Zealand actually at that time. So I was almost voice knowing, chatting to Leachy about what Haraf had spoken about and what we talked about. Um, and then sort of going with that in India, what Richard Dawson made me do as well um, was actually stick to my basics as well. Make sure my best ball was the best it can be at that time. And I think that was something really clear um, that came out. And I think that's the reason why... Um, I think I've certainly progressed and obviously had a little bit of success in international cricket now because I genuinely think my best ball has got a lot better and a lot more consistent, um, which I guess is, is something that we're always striving for. We're obviously always, always also striving that to make sure it's better as well. And I know, I know Jeet's always bangs on about that as well, making sure your best ball is, is good enough. Oh, yeah. I remember like when we were... Playing this game at work, actually, I'd try and buy a variation, and like if I got it wrong, I'd just get yeah. absolute daggers from him. Um, how did you How did you find it working with him at Warwickshire as a youngster? Yeah, it was brilliant. Like especially right at the start of my career, to have that guidance, and like, it wasn't just like in the nets, like or like talking about stuff. Like say, if we're in a game, like to be able to talk to him about my field in the moment, like you touched on there, he played a lot with Jack Leach, and you know we'll get to that in a bit. But, yeah. but having Jeet's knowledge, you know, like you meet top of Mark, and you know you've got the right field because he's he agrees yeah. with you. And I think as well, like you said, as a main spinner, which obviously what you know what you want, you want to be a number one spinner. Like I think it is, yeah. it's different. Like you don't you don't have there's always that bit more doubt, I guess, in your head because you don't, you know, you don't have that kind of, um, I guess, like you know, security blanket of yeah, you know, Jeet's, oh, you've got the right field and stuff. So yeah, it's it's tricky, but yeah, he, he's been massive for me and. You know, I I really hope that he does get a lot of opportunity with his coaching. I think he has got yeah, it's given the game. Um, but yeah, like mate, obviously there's loads of brilliant stuff there. You said I think uh, Richard. I've been lucky enough to do a little bit of work with Richard Dawson. I thought it was great. So I've, him and Haraf, yeah. like from ECB's point of view, like that's top draw from them to give you yeah. and us and that Mason and Verdi, like to give Mace them, birds, yeah. Yeah, to give them, a, you know, you guys a chance to work with them, that's that's top draw. And I think, you know, the the stuff with Haraf wanting to help you, like that's, I think it is, I don't know, I don't think it's completely unique to spin, but I think in spin it's definitely stronger that you have that union. And I guess that's another reason why, you know, I went to this podcast just because the information you can get is, is top draw. And as well, you know, the stuff about your best ball being your most important thing, like I think that's probably been mentioned on every podcast so far. So that's a real common theme. And, People might yeah. get bored of that, but I don't really make I don't make an apology for for trying to have that as like one of the main main messages. So it's the fundamentals, isn't it? Definitely, mate. And so, like going on to uh, Leach and, and playing with Jack Leach, like what what's your relationship like? like? I think just from looking from the outside, it seems like you have a really strong relationship, and you obviously have a lot of success together. So you know, how does that manifest itself, and what what type of stuff are you talking about normally? Mate, we talk as what spinners do. Obviously, we stick together and we we talk about everything, mate. Like, I was just thinking today at training, we just talk so much rubbish. Like, obviously, we talk so much about cricket, and at times it is so useful. But on the other hand, we we're always together, we're always joking around, and I think that's where we've got this real bond and real obviously friendship. And I think it goes obviously right back from obviously when he started having a bit of success and then I sort of came on and we started preparing these wickets and we could work as a genuine partnership. And I think that was amazing. And, and obviously then we've been on the journey um, in the Lions together, um, playing for Somerset together. Um, and we've always been together, firstly competing against each other at training sessions, which is always going to make us better. And we've always had that edge as well, making sure that 
we're on it because we know each other always behind or I'm always behind him and he's always in front of me. We've always tried to have that concept um, about that. And I guess we've all, we've almost had that much success and we've done that well. Um, at times it's probably caused not for us problems, but it's, it's caused obviously selection problems and, and probably frustration at times for myself. But I, the big thing we've always said to each other is that actually take away the cricket. We're very good mates. We're very close mates. And we'd always do anything for each other. And, we'd, and we always stick by that. And that's our number one. And then, I've, and then obviously if we take the cricket side of it, um, we compete against each other. Um, and we do all this. And, and I think we've got a great, because we've got great, a great understanding of each other. Um, at, times it, at times, it can get quite clustered and quite hard, but I think we're both obviously very open and honest to each other that um, it's only positive for us. Um, and obviously, this situation, it's always been, oh, if Leachie's ill, I've sort of come in. And, and that's been really hard, actually, because if it's someone's downfall, um, it's probably, it's usually the other one's success. So Leachie's downfall, him getting ill, getting injured, it's been my success. And, and how he's dealt with that and also said to me um giving me the confidence um and actually being there as a as a really close mate best mate has been amazing and then also on the flip side obviously me not playing at times um little things like me mitting to him um it's quite a tough pill to swallow but you also know that it, it, we are there to help each other and make sure we're getting better and challenging each other. And I think that's something that we've done really well. Um, and I like, obviously I wouldn't be where I am now if I hadn't grown up um, in a, in a squad with Leachie playing with Leachie because um, I've certainly had that drive. Um, and it's just obviously getting to a very interesting time now because we're probably not only are we fighting for a Somerset spot, we're probably fighting for an international spot as well. Um, if you include as well, some of the other sports. So, I guess it's always been in our nature, um, but mate, I wouldn't change it for the world. I think it is, I've, I'm very fortunate to have it and I'm very lucky to have that sort of relationship with him. Yeah, definitely. I think that's, that's top draw, mate. And I think, uh, like, it's, it's a mark of man, I guess. I remember when I got uh, picked for the Lions, I'd been net bowling and in uh, Dubai before that. And I guess he was competing for a spot in the in the white ball squad as well, and I got it, and he was literally the first person to message me. So that just, you know, is a really great guy, and he's obviously very well liked in the England team and yeah. around the whole whole kind of county circuit. And I think as well that, you know, like any spinners, you're always going to be in competition with spinners in your team or spinners in your squad. But I think the the best thing to do is just, you know, have that healthy relationship where you, you know you genuinely want each other to do well, and yeah, that's the best way to share information. And like in the day, if you're I, I always think like if you're worrying about what someone else is doing like in competition with you, like that's, that's never going to be healthy or productive kind of mindset. So, you know, that's, that's great uh, how well you two get on. Like I said, it's probably to the benefit of both of you. You know, you can share information that obviously probably produces yeah. wins for some. I think also like even actually apart getting picked for England as well. Yeah, I think like even like these training sessions that I've had, we've obviously come back and we haven't been bowling a lot and just having him there down the other end, if it's him batting or him bowling with me, um, it's been so good to have because he might pick up on something. Well, obviously, we're obviously very fortunate to also have Jason Kerr, who both knows us really well, and also have uh, Dawson, Richard Dawson come down from Gloucester to help us. Um, it's been so fortunate and something that I obviously very thankful that I've got that sort of group behind me, with me, um, training with me before this bubble because I think I learn a lot and and also as a spinner you don't usually get off you don't often get a spin coach so I think it's even more crucial to work with your spinners and learn like you say learn fields talk talk cricket talk rub it like the chats me and him have been having in the past couple of days is just just such a like like so typical spinners like we're talking about other spinners obviously racking poor balls at West Indies we've been talking about him and sort of like what he does potentially and uh, you obviously got Ross and Chase I just think or obviously Jeets and how Jeets goes about it we've been sending some videos of Jeets and Lion actually how they bowl 
because we keep joking that we keep rolling them out. Uh, we always talk about like ripping the ball, but at the moment, all we're doing is rolling them out. And we're trying to work out how to rip it. So that's actually been quite entertaining in the net. Um, mate, just stupid stuff like that. So I think it'd be interesting to see if uh, Cornwall plays at some point because like, he genuinely puts so much on it, doesn't he? Like, Yeah, and he's got the... Like you, you watch his, you watch his run up, his action. He literally walks in. No, it doesn't look like there's any energy on it, and then he fizzes it out. Mm. That's what me and Leach were actually laughing about. We're like, we, we've, we feel like we're putting so much energy into it. We're almost like rolling the balls out. Whereas, like, I know facing him, he's certainly he's obviously coming from quite a height, and he obviously gets his bounce, and he, he's a powerful lad. So yeah, be interesting to see what he's like. Definitely. So, like before you, sorry, between your kind of debut things in 2018 and and this winter, you know, it's kind of a bit of a break um, in terms of your international career. Like, what what things do you think that you improved on during that time to make it, you know, to first of all get you back into the side, and then obviously have the success of taking wickets this winter as well. Yeah, mate. It was like it was like to be honest, it was like going up Mount Everest and then jumping off at a point because I I. I, I didn't think I was going to obviously do what I did in South Africa and obviously I wasn't on the original tour party um, and didn't get picked for that and I and again that was quite hard to take um, and I didn't really know where I was and I didn't see how I was going to get back into England but I think the big thing was actually again coming back to the present so obviously I played played for England and then and then I sort of a couple of weeks later, I played for the Lions, but then I couldn't get into the Somerset side. Ended up going away, I think playing in a Somerset second team game, uh, Taunton Vale, with no one there against Middlesex. Um, I remember getting 180 um, and bowling quite nicely, and I just couldn't get why, how I wasn't playing or why I wasn't, um, or how I was going to play against, it was India that summer, um, 2018, after the Pakistan series. Like, how am I going to get back into there? And, I lost all sort of focus of getting myself back in the present and and just, um, I guess, sticking to what I knew. I had such a roller coaster ride. And then even going to Yorkshire again, it, like, I wasn't playing. Some sets I was thinking, how am I going to get back to just playing and, and enjoying it again, I guess. And, um, and that was something I really struggled with. But I think looking back now, I think, being in the present is so key and making sure that actually as a spinner obviously it's such a niche um, skill and you can only potentially have one if one at a time really in a, in a team you've got to accept and you've got to find ways of actually bringing yourself back to the present and and also challenging yourself making sure you're getting better and I think the real big thing is having no ego so I think I at times challenge with my ego thinking I've just played for England. I'm 20. I thought I did well. Um, how do I? How 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 have I got to this stage where I'm playing in four weeks later playing in the Somerset Two side? Like, and I was like, I don't get it. Like, I'm better than this. And actually, for me, it was stripping that back and thinking, right, as a as a, as a young spinner who you've got a world class spinner in your ranks as well, um, who's probably been through it all. Stop like stop thinking probably you're the you're so unlucky and actually thinking right how can I what can I do to improve if I get another opportunity how can I make sure I I can get better and be a better bowler and be a better person the big thing I think was being in the present and and actually understanding that as a cricketer as a spinner I think as a bloke in general having no ego um, I think at times obviously going to have to have this persona and confidence about you I think there's two very big differences having confidence and having an ego and I genuinely believe something like that I think I've got a confidence in my abilities but having an ego I think is very it's very dangerous in a negative way and that I think that was something I certainly learned through those years um well last year and the year before that those two years is actually um almost taking it don't take it for granted. Working on your skills, making sure you're better. Big thing, mate, no ego. Um, actually letting other people try and help you. Um, and because you've, you've made it, you think you've made it because you've played a couple of tests. Actually, you haven't. I think that's something really crucial. 
Definitely, I think that stuff about no ego is really interesting. Like my favourite, probably, sportsman or athlete in any sport is Rory McIlroy. I like, love him and he, he talks a lot about um, having that no ego. And I actually haven't read the book yet, but I know there's that uh, book, Ego is the Enemy, that's on my reading list. So, you know, there's, I think that's really, um, really strong stuff, mate. Um, so, obviously, like mostly so far, you've had a lot of your success in Red Bull. Um, came on loan to Yorkshire last year and, and played some T20 and I think you played a bit of white ball for Lions as well. Um, yeah. What, what do you think, like, going forward, like, what's your kind of plan to try and uh, play more white ball cricket and improve your white ball skills? Like, do you think you can, you have to, like, change the way you bowl? Do you think it's just a case of getting more opportunity? Like, what do you think is going to be the keys there? Yeah, I think, I think there's a real um, sort of dovetail with that, I think. I actually, I, I really do believe, I think if you're bowling your best ball and you're, you've got confidence behind you, I think no matter what colour ball it is, um, like your best ball is a very dangerous ball. And I genuinely believe that. And I know, I, I, I remember looking at Jeets. He played that final against Durham. Yeah. He got, took a fourth. And I don't know how he didn't take a five, but like, and he was bowling, I would say, Red Bull cricket. He was bowling his Red Bull cricket. It was ridiculous. And, I, and that was like a real big thing for me is actually, doesn't matter what colour ball it is, um, as long as you're very smart and, again, you're playing the game, you know you, you're switched on with your fields. I think you can, as a finger spinner, you can do that. Um, and I think, and I really do believe that. Um, so I know that if I, I do believe that I haven't had the opportunities that I would have liked. Um, and that's something that I'm looking at for sure. Um, but I think also on that flip side is your best ball is your best ball. And, and it could go for six, but also it could get caught on the ropes because you, you're doing someone in the flight or you're doing someone off the pitch. Um, and I, I, I do also think that you've got to be quite adaptable potentially with different variations. I think certainly in T20 cricket, um, you've got to be really clever as a finger spinner. Um, obviously, being a legger, I think obviously you've got your googlies and your sliders um, to work with. And I know for me that I'm trying a couple of things, but also I do know actually, sort of, I'd like to think I'm quite a mature and intelligent lad that I can also use that side of it in the, in the T20 side. And, and I really... I really do have big aspirations for myself in white ball cricket. I just, at times, probably um, haven't had the opportunities right yet um, to sort of push on. And I think, obviously, my red ball cricket's taken over. But a big thing that I do do hate is um, is get people getting pigeonholed because I think, at times, I think if you're playing cricket at the best ability, it should be in all three all three forms. If you're good enough, you've got confidence. Yeah, completely agree. I think that... That best ball stuff, like especially in 50 over cricket, even T20 cricket, like yeah, exactly what you said, mate. If you are bowling your genuinely your best ball that has loads on it and it's drifting, dropping, spinning, like someone might be able to take that for six, but there's no way they can yeah. continually do that. Even if it's a right hander, like for you or left hander for me, like that is, if you're being honest, yourself and it is your best ball, like that is a hard thing to do. I think like 50 over cricket is interesting. Like you talk about playing the game, I think it is literally that's probably the format where your role can change the most, probably especially as a spinner because, yeah. you, you know, you're probably coming on when the game's already evolved a little bit. And, you know, I, yeah, I think I think 50 over cricket, although it's probably not the most popular around the world, like the, the different scenarios and, and finer tactical points of the game, it's actually like a really interesting format. I think it's actually the most challenging as well. Like you say, I think T20, obviously people are always going to try and take you down. So you've always... I think you've all, I always see T20 of actually, if I can go for as little runs as possible, you know you're going to pick up poles. And that's how I see it. And it might be quite a defensive mindset, but I actually think um, as bowlers, you're, you are defend, you always on that, def, you can be attacked by defending and having that mindset. And, but I think 50 over cricket is amazing because I think, like you said, you've still got that period of time where they, batters have got a bat and they get, they're allowed to get in and they're allowed to sort of not strike at, um, at the beginning, at around a hundred, do you know what I mean? They're not allowed. They're allowed, sorry, to strike at under a hundred. So actually, they can line you up a little bit more. Um, and like you said, you, it changes. It can change so quickly. Mm. And, and I certainly do believe Test cricket's changing now for the likes of the white ball cricket. How how lads 
can reverse sweep you, can try to run down, hit you 360, it is certainly challenging. Definitely. I think, like you said about Jeets, that 2014 final, like, oh, it was literally him bowling a special ball with, you know, and then there's a bit of natural variation. Like, but I think, it, I can't remember if it was that year or the next year we played a game at Trent Bridge and it was like bowling 10 overs of death in a T20. Like, I think 400 was par, basically. Like, so yeah. it does change so much. Like, like I said, I think that playing the game is such an important thing. Like, it's easy to go into a game and think, oh, this is my template. This is what I want to do. But you've got to be adaptable. Like, 100%. I think the most successful players are. I think I... Being someone I look at as well is Mo. Uh, Mo Ali, like, you look at him, white ball cricket, he, I think he's been a very successful bowler. Um, take away his bat, how good he is batter. You look at his bowling and him and Rash as a partnership, I think it's quality. And yeah, obviously really- Rash, gives you, Rash gives you a lot of variety. But I think Mo also, he bowls his best ball and it is good. It, and it might get hit out of the park once or twice, but you also know that he's going to take polls. You know he's going to affect the game. Definitely. I think that as well, that's probably like Mo and Rash is probably another example of like two very good mates having a really successful spin partnership. So it's, you know, same as you and Nietzsche, I guess, you know, that making sure that you do yeah. have a good relationship with your, um, with other spinners around you is really important. Um, so yeah, so cheers, Bessie, mate. This has been awesome. Lots of uh, really good insight for everyone listening, but, just to finish off, this is a question I asked to, to all of my guests and, you know, I'm sure you've, there's a lot of advice you've already given, but, you know, if there's only one bit of on-field and one bit of off-field advice you've got for a young spinner listening, what would it be? I think, I think off-field, um, one of my big beliefs is obviously um, having that no ego and, and actually listening to everyone and, and actually having that advice and I think that goes just in life in general like I, I I see I think a lot of people who are successful have got a lot of confidence and everything but listening to a lot of people getting an understanding um, I think that no ego is certainly something for me off the field and I think on the field um, if you had that as well on the field but enjoying it enjoying sort of the time you have with 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 the players and with your best mates, I guess. And um, I certainly do feel like that, that will take you a long way because I think it's a non-negotiable that you're always going to work hard and strive. And certainly us as first-class cricketers, wanting to be international cricketers, you've, you've got that drive and hunger. It's, it's also making sure you don't get too wrapped up in it and you, you actually take a step back and you enjoy it with your mates. I think that's something I've certainly learned. I think they both come hand in hand. I think one of the great stories, like I could say, I got dropped. Um, and I remember getting 185 and not being happy about it. And I was like, if I took it now, I'd be buzzing. Like, just in general, I remember going into the into the twos at Taunton Vale and going into change rooms. I just wasn't happy about it and I was a bit lost. And I wish I enjoyed those moments because I was actually with a lot of lads I spoke about in the academy, like Green, uh, Ben Green, George Bartlett, Eddie Byram, um, Ollie Sale, Tim Rouse all in the academy that I grew up with and I enjoyed it with them. But at that time, I was so caught up in everything. I didn't enjoy it. And I think that's something I do regret. And I, I certainly try and take with me now. Definitely, mate. I think that's enjoying it. Along with best ball being a really big theme, I think enjoying it's been another theme that's really important. And for me, that would, you know, that would definitely be mine. Like, because A, what's the point if you don't try and enjoy it? And B, like, if you enjoy it, that probably puts you in the best frame of mind to perform um so yeah so thanks Betty. that was that was brilliant mate uh thanks for giving up your time and uh wishing you all the best for the summer and hopefully get the free lines back on cheers buddy thank you